morning. Today we have Philip Brudney uh, with us who's going to talk about the latest Privacy Shield developments. And Phil, before we kick this off, I feel like we need to share some credentials so everyone knows that we're talking to someone extremely qualified here <laughs> to speak sure. to the subject. So Phil, uh, let me see if I have it all. CIPP US, CIPP EU, uh, fellow in privacy with the IEPP, ISO 27701, lead auditor, CIPM, which is Privacy Program Manager, am I a CPA, am I missing any other credentials? Uh, those are all the privacy ones, <laughs> appreciate it. Yeah, so needless to say, highly qualified to speak on the subject, a uh, data protection officer uh, for, for various organizations that we consult with. Uh, also myself, Christian Hyatt, um, have a privacy background as well and help consult clients. So kind of the, the latest development here that we wanted to talk about today was the Privacy Shield has been invalidated um, through SHRMS 2. So I thought it might be helpful to talk about why that's important, Phil, give a little bit of history and then get your analysis on what the impact to companies are and what they need to be thinking about. So you sent a couple articles for me to debrief myself uh, here ahead of the call. So let me see if I have this right. So I think why we care is really there's been some mechanisms for organizations uh, in the EU to transfer data in, on a, in a lawful way uh, to the US. And, and I think originally that was uh, the EU US safe harbor uh, that was invalidated by SHRMS-1. Uh, then Privacy Shield was introduced um, to, to do that. And now Privacy Shield has been invalidated by SHRMS-2. And I think, yep. and uh, SHRMS-2 did two things, Phil, correct me if I'm wrong here. One, invalidated Privacy Shield and also clarified some, uh, some standard contractual clauses. So if you want to do a B2B agreement and you have standard contractual clauses, you can do that outside a regulatory body. You can do that business to business. But they basically doubled down on that and said, hey, you have to there's some there's some teeth behind this now and some requirements to do that. So now I think yeah. companies are wondering, what do I do? How is this going to impact me? Can I still transfer data? Does the show go on? What do I do? So so can you give us a rundown, Phil? If I'm a client and I'm you know, US business doing business in the EU, what can I expect? Hmm. Yeah, so this this is a big deal. Um, a lot of companies were coming to rely on the privacy shield for data transfers. Uh, there had been this outstanding question for a little while about how long the EU would accept those, but um, it wasn't until this recent decision that they finally put an end to privacy shield. So uh, the standard contractual clauses, they've been out there for a while, but the court decision did kind of say you you can't just set these and forget these. So I think one thing you'll you'll definitely see is any company exporting data from the EU to the US is going to have to do a little bit of diligence to understand uh, to understand your your position with government surveillance, with security, uh, to make sure that it's a still a valid transfer. Yeah, and and just I guess to clarify some terms that may or may not be intuitive, but the standard contractual clauses, and you'll also see SCC, those are literally clauses in a business to business agreement. And I think previously we've seen a lot of these. They've kind of been all over the place, um, you know, mm -hmm. different from organization to organization, but they are standardizing these and, and issuing new govern or new requirements around what these clauses are. And I wrote down a couple of them. They they allude to something in paragraph 133 called supplementary measures. I don't know what that is. Maybe you do. Uh, they talk about additional safeguards. That's paragraph 134. They talk about and this is kind of the meat of it that they have to have effective mechanisms to make it possible to practice. So you actually have to be able to do what you're saying you're going to do in your contract. Yep. And then the big piece of that is the, the company in the EU now has a requirement to do adequate due diligence to make sure that you can meet your contractual requirements. So what mm -hmm. that says to me is, hey, a US based company, you're about to see an uptick and probably some contract negotiations of some sort likely, and then probably an uptick in due diligence activity. So all of the questionnaires that everyone loves and the audit reports and mm -hmm. certifications, I, I would totally expect an uptick in that. 
Is that kind of your read on it, Phil, or are you expecting anything different? Uh, I think that's pretty accurate. Uh, so one thing I would say for context is looking at the universe of transfers of data outside the EU, the reason all of these frameworks exist is because the EU really says you can't transfer personal data outside of the EU unless the country you transfer it to provides an adequate level of protection for data. Mm -hmm. So the meat of the dispute with the U.S. is some U.S. government surveillance practices. Um, I'm sure listeners are familiar with some of them, but the Patriot Act, the Freedom Act, FISA, uh, the Snowden revelations, those all uh, have an impact on how the EU sees the U.S. So, yeah. go ahead. And I was going to say, so basically the EU has said as an entity, we don't have a lot of trust in you. U.S. Mm -hmm. based companies because largely because of the government uh, government surveillance and, and the likelihood that, hey, I might I might be a uh, EU based company transfer some data to a data center in the U.S. Well, is that suddenly subject to a FISA warrant? And what is the mechanism exactly. that, you know, what's the impact to my citizens uh, in accordance? And I think they're working this out. So this isn't even business yeah. to business. This is a government to government dispute largely uh, from my read on it. And I was also reading, Phil, that I think essentially we're kind of waiting on clarifying guidance right now. We don't know exactly which way this is going to fall. So mm -hmm. what do you think like in the interim companies should be doing? Do we have any like recommendations on that? Yeah, I, I think there are, there are a few things. One, if you've been following Privacy Shield, I would say continue following it. Um, you're as a U.S. company, if you've agreed to comply with it, you're still subject to Department of Commerce jurisdiction. Um, and there's also that possibility that if and when a new safe harbor comes out, that companies that have already complied with Privacy Shield will have a easier time getting under the new one. So I'd say that's one thing. Um, and if it's something that your company hasn't considered, I would say you need to get get a handle on government surveillance requirements and how that might affect your company. Because I, I do think that EU controllers will begin to ask that as, as they really dig into their standard clauses and whether you're able to meet those. So, you, so you'll want to understand that. Yeah, I made a quick list of things I think maybe companies should should consider too. I think first, um, maybe go ahead and have some standard contractual clauses prepared. So you're going to enter into some agreements or some, some company is going to ask about those. So maybe go ahead and have a set of those contractual requirements pre-written in a template format that you can deploy that are likely going to satisfy those requirements. Um, I think prepare to be able to address questions around it in the form of due diligence. So whatever your app, whatever you've agreed to to date whether that be standard standard contractual requirements or privacy shield or gdpr go ahead and have have a response prepared in the form of maybe a, a due diligence package that you're going to provide or, or just be able to verbally uh, talk about that and then um, i think right now is the right time to carefully monitor regulatory guidance uh, between the eu and us because because we should certainly expect something uh, over the coming year hopefully um, that's going to clarify what we need to do. Like you said, a new privacy shield or a new safe harbor or or just enhanced guidance on what the standard contractual clauses should look like. Um, what about GDPR? I think that's, that's still a good thing to comply with. That's still applicable. I mean, I, I'm not seeing any major changes there. Like you still need to comply with that. Still need to have a strategy around that. Do you agree? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You You still so GDPR Article 28 is your processor requirements, which really apply regardless of where the processor is located. So you want to make sure that any processor you're utilizing is able to comply with with those requirements. Um, as a processor, you want to make sure that you're able to meet GDPR requirements that your partners will have. Yep. So that, that this, this doesn't 
have an impact on overall GDPR compliance, in my yep. opinion. Yeah, and then I think big picture, talking about privacy program management, we, we know we have just more and more complexity global. Like every country is issuing privacy requirements. There's uh, there's combativeness between countries and businesses. So that's going to continue to become more and more complex. And then if you zoom into the US only states, every state is doing something different. CCPA was the big one back in July that became active. Um, and this is where we're pushing clients, I think, and that brings me to ISO 27701, and that is the uh, privacy certification uh, that the ISO certifying bodies have kind of brought to the fore here recently to solve this uh, need to prove out that you, you're, you have a privacy program. So if, if you're a company wondering how you can evidence to your partners that you've built out a privacy program, if you're looking for a, a one size solution, that will solve the many different privacy regulations. Uh, Phil and I did a separate webcast on ISO 27701. Highly recommend taking a look at that. I think that's only become more important as we go forward to be able to prove and Absolutely. communicate and have a framework to work behind because at the end of the day, it's not possible for companies to have a hundred different privacy regulations to keep track of. They need one strategy that sets the bar and that's what they follow. And I, I believe that's what most companies are going to go after. So that I think those are my takeaways. You have the, the ISO 27701, the, the immediate action items that you and I just talked about, Phil, and then really just monitoring what's going to happen on a go forward basis. Uh, anything else kind of as we close that we definitely need to uh, be thinking about? Um, all right. I just say clearly the EU and the US still want to be able to do business together. Um, it, it's hard to imagine that something would cut that off completely. So I'd definitely say be, be on the lookout for that new guidance and hear what the path forward is going to be because certainly it's, it's too vital to cut off. Yep, absolutely. Cool. Well, I think that's a good summary. Phil, thanks for your time. Thanks for your expertise and guidance here. Um, if anyone wants to reach out to Phil, uh, you can email him. His, his email is philip.brudney at risk360.com. Phil also has probably a couple dozen white papers and blog posts uh, that you can find on risk360.com that provide some great guidance on CPA, GDPR, ISO 27701. I'll take some credit for editing some of those, but uh, Phil, Phil is the brainchild behind that. Um, and we appreciate you listening. Thanks, Phil. Thanks, Christian.